I'm Dave Miranda, past president and general counsel of the New York State Bar Association. Welcome to a special Miranda Warnings video presentation on the birth of the New York State Bar Association. Today we're going to talk about the birth of the New York State Bar Association with Hank Greenberg. Welcome, Hank. Thank you for having me. Hank is a shareholder at the law firm of Greenberg Traug. He's the 122nd president of the New York State Bar Association. And he recently wrote a definitive article on the creation and birth of the New York State Bar Association that appeared in the State Bar Journal. Excellent article. Thank you, Hank. Thank you. What compelled you to do this research and, and write this article in the first place? I've um, long been an amateur legal historian. And uh, while I was president of the State Bar Association, uh, as you made good fun of me during my year, I had an opportunity to look at those dusty archives from time to time. I came across, um, over the internet, three old pieces of paper. Um, that were some of the first documents created by the Bar Association shortly after it was formed. And one of these documents was this magnificently produced small pamphlet that had within it the minutes of the convention held on November 21, 1876, that established the association, the founding documents, if you will, the Constitution and the Bylaws, and the names of more than a thousand lawyers. And then I quickly discovered that nearly 75 years after that little pamphlet was created, the association in the 1940s created a facsimile of the very same document and distributed it to law libraries around the country. So all of that sparked my curiosity, and that's how it began. And so as you mentioned, the formal formation of the New York State Bar Association was on November 21st, 1876. Tell us a little bit about what was going on in the state and the country at that time where it would make sense for the, there to be a New York state-wide legal association. Well, first of all, 1876 was an unusually eventful year in America. Uh, the nation was celebrating the centennial anniversary, uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Um, in every realm of American life, extraordinary things were happening. Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone. Thomas Edison was thinking about how to create a phonograph. And in New York and the nation, politically, uh, 1876 was an extraordinarily tumultuous year. There was a presidential election. This old, everything's old as new again. A highly controversial presidential election that was held between two candidates, the governor of the state of New York, the Democrat Samuel Tilden, and a Republican from Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes. And on election night, it was evident that Tilden had a decisive victory in the popular vote. But as the days went on, it was clear that four states that had the necessary votes for either candidate to win the Electoral College and become president, there was a dispute. Um, and New Yorkers were passionately interested, all Americans were, but New Yorkers were because their governor was the seeming winner of that election. And as events ultimately came to be, uh, Tilden lost. Um, a few days before the inaugural in March of 1877, the Electoral College, based on a recommendation of a congressional committee, went by one vote for Hayes. But to your question, what does all of this have to do with the law, especially in the Empire State? You have to think of a few things. One, New York is the economic center of the country. It is still today, but in a way then that's hard to imagine. It was also sort of the political heartbeat of the nation, uh, in addition to Washington, D.C. New York governors were instantaneously considered candidates to be president of the United States. And New York was then, as now, had the largest concentration of talented lawyers in the nation, six to 7,000 lawyers. Bar associations, up until that point, were largely social organizations, on the whole and by and large, with one notable exception the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, formed in 1870. We now refer to it as the City Bar. And over the next few years, it became increasingly clear 
especially with respect to state legislative policy and the court system, that lawyers could speak with greater force if they were an organic whole, if the entire state was knitted together in a single association of lawyers. And at that time, New York, just as an economic and political proposition, upstate New York, relative to today, was even more consequential and powerful. Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse were little economic powerhouses, in addition to the city of New York. So upstate and downstate, there was a collective sense that the bar could be more influential in advocating in the legislature, more influential in the development of the court system and the development of jurisprudence if they were a single association. And so up until that point, for the most part, bar associations were, as you said, social organizations where attorneys would get together socially. And now the thought was that they should have some influence on policy and advocacy and government right. and good government. So what was the, the seed that started in, in the city bar? Um, probably the impetus for it all. Uh, was an article in a very influential publication, legal publication at the time, known as the Albany Law Journal. It was the most widely read national legal publication in the country. And uh, its editorial on June 26, 80, 1875, its lead editorial, referencing the city bar's formation was that there was a need for a statewide bar association. Uh, Elliot Fitch Shepard, who was um, a charter member of the City Bar Association uh, and a pillar of the New York City community, um, was somehow inspired to take to the City Bar the idea of creating, of being the driving force to create a state bar association. Shepard was an interesting guy, um, um, enormously wealthy. Uh, he had married into the family of Cornelius Vanderbilt, the uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates of his time, the wealthiest man in the world. He was a corporate lawyer who also represented the New York Central Railroad, and he had a passion for starting things. And he took to the city bar a resolution in October of 1875 to create a committee that would investigate the possibility of creating a state bar association. The city bar embraced the idea, and Shepard chaired a five-person committee that, with extraordinary enthusiasm, drove into this project headlong. Um, they conducted a statewide survey uh, of over 1,300 lawyers in the state. Uh, but let's talk about the survey just, I mean, for yeah. the, at the time, right? They yeah. didn't, it wasn't an internet poll, right? I mean, right. they actually prepared a written survey, figured out the addresses of where all the attorneys were, right. mailed it to all the attorneys that could have the correspondence for, right. and then actually got several hundred responses back. They did. They did. Uh, actually, uh, there was um, um, a very impressive uh, response to the survey. Uh, 16 questions asking all manner of things, including dues, how members would be selected, where the headquarters of a bar association would be. Um, over 300 people said yes, create a state bar association. Only four said no. Overwhelmingly, the thought was that the headquarters would be Albany, not surprising, the capital of the state at the time. Uh, and the question that sparked the most disagreement uh, or division was over how members would be chosen. Uh, most thought they should be uh, any person who was admitted to the bar in good standing. Others thought local bar organizations ought to make the appointment. But that enthusiastic response caused Shepard to go back um, uh, with his colleagues on this committee, and they produced a report that is just brimming with enthusiasm and excitement about the project, um, with recommendations about how to actually go about creating the association. And then the, the report of this committee was approved by the city bar and it recommended that there be a statewide convention of lawyers uh, to determine how the New York State Bar Association would be formed. And that took place here in Albany, in, in, in the capital. Shepard and his committee had an enormous amount of work to do to choreograph that event. Um, the idea of this convention, which was a popular mechanism at the time 
for creating things. The state was familiar with holding constitutional conventions was to have delegates from each of the state's eight judicial districts. Today we have 13. Back then there were eight. Each district was supposed to elect 20 delegates and 20 alternates. The thinking was that that would ultimately result in 100 lawyers from around the state coming to the convention. They had to find a venue, and they found a magnificent venue, the assembly chamber of the old state capitol, a building that Abraham Lincoln spoke at. The venue was there, and the idea was to sort of use the convention primarily to create the structure. And so the delegates um, on November 21st, um, late November of 1876, convened at 3.30 in the assembly chamber. And, and at that point, they chose a leader of the convention, not the leader of the association, but the leader of the, Correct. Of the convention. And, and who was that? Um, and they divided the convention really into two separate meetings. The first meeting, as you indicated, was the formative steps. Right. The chair of that, uh, uh, that part of the meeting was William C. Ruger, um, an enormously prominent lawyer from Syracuse, New York, who just a few years later uh, became a president of the State Bar Association and ran as an attorney in private practice and was elected to be chief judge of the state of New York. So he presided over the first phase, which were the actual steps of taking a vote to establish the association, approve constitution and bylaws, and 91 delegates showed up and participated in that. And at the time, and up until the 70s, uh, the judges on New York's Court of Appeals, New York's highest court, were elected. Correct. And oftentimes, involvement in the New York State Bar Association would increase the prominence of someone that may have been interested in, in running for a chief judge or to be on the Court of Appeals. And we have many past presidents who've also served on the Court of Ab Appeals. Absolutely right. When Ruger, uh, in 1882, uh, announced his intention to run for chief judge, uh, one newspaper uh, in an editorial said, what better credential could there be to be chief judge than being head of the state's bar association. So from the very beginning of the association, the connection and relationship between NISBA and the Court of Appeals was very clear. The first president of the state bar, John K. Porter, was a former judge of the Court of Appeals. Ruger, as I said, was a future chief judge. And others who were at the convention at the time went on to be judges of the court. So, so Ruger uh, heads the convention and the convention forms the New York State Bar Association. Right. Initially with how many members? Well, um, on day one, November 21, no dues paying members, uh, but as measured a year later at the first annual meeting, there were 356 dues paying members. There were also at the time a number of honorary members, uh, the justices of the United States Supreme Court, the judges of the Court of Appeals and others. But the first, let's call them the charter members of the association, number 356. And so those charter members, they select a president. The delegates at the convention um, voted on a slate of officers um, at the very end of phase one, uh, included a gentleman by the name of John K. Porter and a series of vice presidents that collectively were a legal dream team not just Ruger, all of them were prominent figures in the state, many of them judges and former state legislators and the like. And so they selected John Porter, who was the first president of the New York State Bar Association. Porter was, uh, although today lo lost to history, an extraordinary figure. In 1876, people would have probably described him as the ideal person to head the first statewide bar association. He was not just a former judge of the Court of Appeals, he was amongst the most eminent, if not the most, the most eminent trial lawyer in the nation. The largest cases, the most sensational cases, John K. Porter usually was involved in at that time. He was described by many as as close as one can come to genius um, in the legal profession. Uh, at the first annual meeting, the very next year, November 20, 1877, 
He delivered an address that people decades later referred to as nothing short of thrilling. The title of the address was The Purposes and Aims of the Association. And I would describe the mission that he laid out as essentially threefold. First and foremost, he said the association was formed to accomplish noble aims, to be, to use his phrase, of practical benefit to the profession and to the public at large. The idea was that we would develop public policy suggestions, recommendations to improve the law that could be achieved from a practical perspective. He viewed lawyers as fundamentally um, a pragmatic profession that was all about putting points on the board, being able to advance the law, public policy, and society. And he viewed that from day one as the essential mission of the association, but also to serve the public. So in the formation of ideas to improve the court system, the goal was to also serve the consumers of the court system, the public. Uh, he also viewed the association as striving to have a collective influence and a permanent influence. There had been a couple of efforts to create statewide bar associations in the country. All of them failed. New York was now trying to do something and did do something that was enormously impactful in the empire state, the most powerful state in the nation, and his aspiration, his goal in this speech, he spoke to the future. He spoke to future generations of lawyers who would look back on those who formed the association with pride and respect. And his aspiration and hope was that the collective influence the association had would be permanent and continue in the years to come. Uh, I was struck in your article about how many parallels there were between the issues that our Bar Association faced when it was formed uh, that are consistent with the issues that we still face, membership, dues. The issue of whether the Bar Association should be focusing purely on legal and attorney issues versus whether we should be uh, addressing social issues that are, are, are of concern to the entire uh, populace. And I'd like to, to talk about uh, each of those. Uh, they had a committee on prizes <laughs> right? right? We don't have a committee on prizes anymore. We don't. Maybe we'll try we don't. to reinstate that. Their first act was to give an award to an essay on labor relations, basically. Correct. And so that was one of their first acts. And they were criticized for it because they said, well, the Bar Association should really stay in its lane. Why is it talking about labor relations when it should really be focusing on legal professional issues. And we oftentimes today are grappling with that with that same issue. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and the criticism came from no less, at least implicitly, than the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, Sanford Church. Uh, the Committee on Prizes, what I would say is sort of interesting, the association does still give out awards. So from the very beginning, when it formed its five original standing committees, one of them was Prizes. It was chaired by none other than Elliot Shepard. Uh, now, one thing to know about Elliot Shepard, uh, and he was a remarkable and interesting guy in his own right, uh, but he was also one of the more conservative people in the state of New York. He lectured and authored articles that extolled the virtues of capitalism um, and was critical of the then um, um, forming labor movement in America. And 1876 uh, and 7 is right smack in the middle of what we historians describe as the Gilded Age, a period of extraordinary economic growth in the country, uh, but the disparity between uh, the wealthy and everybody else was gaping and growing. Uh, the labor movement was starting and there were incidents of violence and riots and strikes that uh, were on the front page of newspapers all throughout this period. So if you had to find a hot button issue um, that people uh, um, would likely disagree about and dispute, it was the relationship between management and their employees, between capital and labor. And Shepard thought that would be a great idea for an essay, the first essay, 
that was available to young lawyers who could submit it with that subject. They ultimately decided to give the award to a young lawyer by the name of Walter Howe in New York City, who went on to be uh, a politician. Um, and it was given at the first annual meeting in 1877. The person selected to give this award was the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, Samford Church. I doubt he knew what he was getting into when they first asked him to show up at the first meeting. Uh, but when he entered the assembly chamber, there was a loud applause greeting the chief judge. Um, and he gave brief remarks in which he congratulated the association on its formation, wished it well into the future, and then delivered in a few sentences a stern lecture. Um, what he said was that the association should confine itself strictly to law reform, strictly to those kinds of issues that um, were, would elevate the profession, address what lawyers do in courts and in other settings and contexts, and stay away from divisive and controversial issues. He said if they followed his advice, the association would be eminently successful, and if they didn't, it would only engender dis dissension and the association would fail. So to your point, uh, this idea uh, that the association, all bar associations struggle with, which is trying to identify what kinds of issues it should stake out a public policy position in, and those issues that some might think are too overtly political and not tethered in any way to the practice of law. There's the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, you know, planting his flag on the side of, and reasonable minds can disagree whether he was right or not, stick to what lawyers do. Another parallel uh, that I saw was regarding membership. Of course, the State Bar Association was and remains a voluntary association, so no attorney is required to be a member of the New York State Bar Association. Talk a little bit about the thought process that went into seeking members at the time in 1876. Nothing's changed uh, for a bar leader, uh, which is, you know, among other things they have to think about being focused on the bottom line, paying the bills, uh, which is a function of having members who pay dues. And the association from its very beginning was laser focused on growing the membership. And interestingly enough, the person who sort of took the lead was a gentleman by the name of Rufus Peckham Jr. That was a very famous name um, in Albany. His father was a judge of the Court of Appeals and Rufus Peckham Jr. went on to be, like, like his father, a judge of the New York Court of Appeals and ultimately a justice of the US Supreme Court. But back then, he was the treasurer of the New York State Bar Association. And immediately after uh, the convention forming the association, he got to work trying to recruit and solicit people to join the association. Initially, he had a problem. Uh, the association had created this unbelievably complicated Byzantine arcane process there were district committees in the eight judicial districts that would have to nominate and unanimously agree on a candidate. They would forward it to a standing committee, the Committee on Admissions. They would likewise have to approve it. That would then go to an executive committee. But ultimately, what's sort of interesting, and hearkening back to your first question, why did I write this article? That blue book I mentioned at the beginning, that beautifully produced document with the names of over a thousand lawyers. What was it? It was the New York State Bar Association's first solicitation device for members. The Blue Book was created and sent to approximately 1,500 lawyers around the state, recommended by the district committees, and identified as members elect. These were people that the executive committee, the admissions committee, the districts satisfied themselves would be wonderful members if they would pay the $5 admissions fee and annual dues of $5 a year. By the way, those dues remained in place for 52 years. The dues didn't change until 1928 when they were raised to $6 a year. Peckham um, was having a devil of a time getting people to join, uh, and that was basically what he was tasked to do. But ultimately, the Blue Book, 
uh, which was submitted with a cover letter uh, and another document, which made it very easy for a person to sign their name, saying that they would uh, firm and avow that they would follow the Constitution of the State Bar and pay their admissions fees, they would join it. Ultimately, as the first annual meeting was starting to come around, the number of people increased so that by November 2018-77, there are 356 members. A far cry from 70,000, uh, but when you look at the list of people who joined the association at the beginning, it's extraordinary. The original group, I mean, just to talk about a few of them, um, and the first couple of years included a very ambitious young lawyer from Buffalo by the name of Grover Cleveland. He became a vice president of the association, first was elected governor um, in 1882, and as governor presided over an annual meeting of the State Bar Association. Another early member of the association was Chester Arthur, uh, who likewise became president of the United States. I said a little bit about Rufus Peckham, soon to be a justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, and so many others. Let me ask you what you think those founders, those leaders, would think of our Bar Association today. First of all, they would be astonished, absolutely astonished, at the technological innovations. We now have a virtual bar center, right, that can reach in a nanosecond, lawyers throughout the state. Uh, I think they would be dazzled by our continuing legal education programs, um, uh, amazed by all sorts of programming that we do. Um, I think one thing they would look at in the legal profession today, though, and not, not just specific uh, to the state bar, but just the profession as a whole that is different. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the leaders of the country, the leaders of the state, more often than not, were huge figures in the legal profession. So then relative today, significantly more lawyers were legislators and elected officials. And then more so today, the leaders of the New York State Bar Association were people that typically had vast governmental experience. Many of them were former elected officials or future elected officials. Many of them were profoundly connected to the operations of the state government. Um, you know, when you think of sort of the association in its formative and early years, and you look at the people who were president of the state bar, these were people that are far more readily recognized as leaders of the country. Charles Evans Hughes was the president of the State Bar Association. He went on to be a United States Secretary of State, one of the great chief justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. Elihu Root was a president of the New York State Bar in its early years, a future Secretary of State. So I think that's one thing they'd look at today and see a difference. Um, and it's not just the New York State Bar. I think, you know, uh, typically sort of the leaders of the great law firms of the era in the 19th century were people who moved seamlessly from government to private practice. So that's one notable difference. You know, in looking at how quickly they moved, right, they moved from concept to creation in about a year. What lessons can we take today as a bar association from the work of, of these people? Such a good point you make. Uh, it's stunning not just the velocity of the work that was done, but the quality of it and the quantity of it. We talked about the Shepherd Committee report. In a pre-internet era, pre-electronic mail, all snail mail, no cars, literally the horse and buggy era, they surveyed 1,300 lawyers across the state. They then collated all that information and produced a remarkable report. They then organized a convention at which, and if you read the minutes of the convention, it is stunning. They thought of everything. And the amount of things to think about was enormous. Creating the Constitution, drafting the bylaws, identifying, recruiting, and having ready to go an entire slate of leaders, including 24 members of an executive committee. These were enormously accomplished, impressive, talented people with a deep passion 
for public service. And I know it sounds uh, perhaps a little trite and hackneyed when I say these were people who had an exalted vision of the legal profession, profession and its potential to influence to the good public policy for the profession uh, and the public. So, you know, to me, the lesson is uh, think about and be inspired by why these people did what they did, how they came up with this vision, and how they hoped that it would serve the profession and the public. That, to me, is the enduring message. Well, Hank Greenberg, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us on the history and the birth of the New York State Bar Association. Thank you for the countless hours of research that you did to bring us to this point. Uh, thank you also uh, for your service to the Bar Association as its past president and service to the legal profession. And, and it's always wonderful to hear your thoughts on the legal profession and the New York State Bar Association. Well, thank you, David, and the same to you.